I really uh, am impressed by the turnout here. Um, a little about myself. Um, I went through a bit of a career change. Uh, I used to be an aerospace engineer. So I was an engineer for nine years and then uh, decided to follow my passion in life for California native plants. And I became a licensed landscape contractor about 25 years ago. And since that time, have designed or installed over 750 California native landscapes in Southern California. And some of the notable projects, the one you might have heard of is maybe the Del Mar Thoroughbred Racetrack. You know, where the turf meets the surf in Old Del Mar. Well, we landscaped the infield of that racetrack all in California native plants. And uh, written a couple of books with Lucy Warren. I don't know if they're for sale here today or not, but um, if they are, I'd be happy to sign them for you if you're interested. The first one was the California Native Landscape. It came out in 2013. It's a, an incredibly complete overview of native horticulture. You know, most of the plant books out there are just kind of plant encyclopedias. They're excellent books, some incredibly wonderful books, but they don't really get into the in-depth of native horticulture, and I think there needs to be some, some real separation between how we approach planting native landscapes versus ornamental horticultural landscapes versus agriculture. Because a lot of that's getting mixed up, and I'm telling you, California native ecology is very different than the typical ornamental horticulture we've been taught, which you end up throwing out the window. So anyway, we talked about that in depth in that book, and then the second one is our plant encyclopedia. So that's called the Drop to, Home, the, uh, Drop to Fine California Garden. Uh, just to let you know, the most of the plants, well, let, let me tell you where I'm from. So I'm up from San Diego. And by comparison, San Diego's annual rainfall is between 9 and 12 inches. 2017, 2018 winter, we got three and a half. Wildfire is a year-round occurrence for us now. When I left here Thursday afternoon, the offshore winds were 60 miles an hour at 7% humidity, and it was 85 degrees. Okay, it's a blast furnace. And basically, I never thought I'd be speaking in Marin. <laughs> and here we are. Things have changed. But I want to share some of the things we've, we've learned over the years. Uh, we know a thing or two about fires down there. And um, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today you probably have never heard about before. I, I think we've got some new concepts we're going to introduce. Some of it is kind of feel a little contradictory to maybe some of the approaches you've heard. Um, we'll try to address that and uh, we'll just uh, kind of talk about what's made our approach, I think, really successful for us in a very, very harsh condition down there. But basically, if you wonder if it's that applicable up here, well, basically, if you can be successful with native landscapes, Southern California, it just gets easier as you come north. It really is. It's a little more forgiving up here, to be honest with you, which is great. Okay? And the dirty little secret, honestly, most of the plants that we use in native landscaping in San Diego County have names like Cianothus Yankee Point, <laughs> Bacchus Pigeon Point, Bacchus Twin Peaks. You get, you get where I'm going with this? We're actually having to adapt our landscaping to grow your plants, so it works. Most of our plants do come from the chaparral, our Mediterranean coastal plant communities, which is very unique. There's only five of these regions in the world, guys. You know, down there they like to say we live in the desert. No, the desert is actually about 60 miles east of us. We live in the Mediterranean climate zone. And what's the difference? We get most of our rainfall in the wintertime fairly dry in summertime. The desert actually gets most of its rainfall in the summertime in the form of thunderstorms, and that is a very different ecology, okay? 
So what are some of these threats to our native plant communities? You're starting to become familiar with them. Well, certainly land abuse, you might think you're looking at an oak savanna, but no. Actually, you're looking at a cow pasture with some oak trees in it. And also, oh, I hit the wrong, you know what I'm doing? I hit the up arrow to go forward, it's <laughs> exited down now, sorry. And then fuel reduction, especially when they're doing fuel reduction in the middle of nowhere, because they've got a lot of grant money, they've got a lot of those carbon credits, and they've got to spend them. And this is a disaster, because that ends up turning into this. Flashy fuels, okay, non-native grasses, Armageddon, desertification, erosion. I mean, look at that. That's a so-called eco-preserve. I don't know what they're preserving there. But look at the, look at these rivulets and the erosion there. Okay, that's what happens with, with too many fires, too much clearance. And yes, chaparral can be eliminated by the wrong type of fire. It's not made to burn. <coughs> These ecosystems are made to burn like your house is made to burn because you have fire insurance. Okay? There, this is a great example right here. Too many fires, no plant community. That burned in 1970, this burned again in 2001, this burned again in 2003. Do you see what's going on here? We're tight converting from basically clean chaparral the weedy cow pasture. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't come back from this, okay? You see these grassy hillsides, that's all non-native grass, guys. That is, that's a weedy cow pasture you're looking at. You're not looking at grassland, you're really not. I mean, and this gets turned into this. That's too many fires. I'm not a big fan of prescribed birds. There's already too much burning in our landscapes, okay? You want to convert chaparral into non-native grassland, just burn it twice in 10 years. Let's see what's left. <sighs> that doesn't mean that being dense and impenetrable are not the natural condition of chaparral. They are. And this is a very important concept. I know Todd touched on this. And actually, it's not about cons con conservation. It's, it's not about the sub fire sub uh, suppression policy of our agencies, okay? Now I'm talking coastal Mediterranean climate zones. You can't suppress fire in the chaparral. There's no stopping it, okay? These things burn all the way to the ocean, okay? Um, and what they were adapted to are really intense, catastrophic, but infrequent fires. Well, that's changing with human habitation. And right now, most experts agree on a natural fire frequency of every 30 to 130 years. That's natural, okay? Any higher than that, you simply lose the ecosystem. It cannot sustain that much burning. So think about it. What are your natural ignition sources? So you take man out of the equation. What are your natural ignition sources for fire? Lightning. lightning. Okay, anybody else? How about lightning? Anybody say lightning? Yes. Yeah. Oh, wait, there's one. Volcanoes. <laughs> and how often do we have lightning storms during Santa Ana wind events? So it was a rare confluence of factors that would allow for a fire to maybe get ignited by uh, a lightning storm and then persist around for weeks or months to finally get picked up by Santa Ana in the fall and then we're off to the races. So that was not a very frequent event. Okay, well then people say, well what about indigenous people? Well yeah, indigenous people, you, they like to, to, they did, well, it depends on what culture, actually. It depends on what group you're talking about. Because not everybody was burning <laughs> fires, right? But some were, and those ones that were, I mean, they weren't after burning down their villages. They weren't after burning down their, their hunting grounds. They weren't after burning down their neighbors. Yeah, some of them got away. 
And maybe there's even some evidence that that mosaic we see around here, of uh, sort of like heavy vegetation and light vegetation or grasses, might have something to do with some of that indigenous burning. But it was just small-scale agriculture. They were burning off shrubs to encourage bulbs and forbs, just as mankind has done from the beginning, right? These were irrelevant from an evolutionary time scale because chaparral has been around for around 10 million years. And humans, about 15,000 in North America. So, vast majority are human caused. For all San Diego counties, it ranges between 97 to 100% human ignition from 1919 to 2016. Okay. So here's some common ignition sources. Arson. Power lines. I ended up doing a lot of the survey work in the backcountry for SDG&E in 2007. We lost between 10,000 and 100,000 Engelman oak trees. Smoking. This is huge. Sparking landscape equipment. Please, you're in the middle of summer and it's hot and dry, or you're in a Santa Ana. I don't know, do they call them Santa Anas up here when you have a hot, dry offshore? Diablo wind, right? You know what I'm talking about, though, when I'm referring to Santa Ana. That's what I'm referring to, Diablo wind. Well, if you're out in a Diablo wind and you're using a, uh, some power equipment, please have like a couple of buckets of water or a hose nearby. So many of these fires get start to get sparked by uh, equipment. Trash burning. That's how the Pumashaw fire started, burned down half of Palomar Mountain. Somebody decided to burn their trash in the middle of the Santa Ana. <laughs> Cars. Bad catalytic converters. Those you'll see that go along the freeway. Boom, boom, boom. Fire after fire after fire. Is it spitting out its guts and burning the gas and stuff? Children playing with fire. That's actually a thing. <laughs> so let's get into these fuel management zones, okay? So as Todd mentioned, you most have a, a zonal approach for that first 100 feet. Uh, first zone 1 or A is usually 30 to 50. That actually starting to expand it out to 30 to 50 feet. And zone 2 or B is usually 50 to 70, sometimes 150 feet or even more. Um, <clears throat> So zone A, zone one, this third theory is, is, is really the most critical to vessel space. Firefighters actually make conscious decisions. When they go through a neighborhood and they look at a property and they say, Do, I don't really want to die trying to protect somebody's possessions. So we're going to skip that house there. Or I can set up a perimeter on this house. Okay, they make a conscious decision. If they see that you've got ridiculous vegetation growing up to the ease of your shake shingled house, they're probably going to move on. So, as Todd mentioned, spot fires are everything. Okay, it's usually not this wall of flame that just blows over your house, as he showed in that picture. It's usually these spot fires. Okay. And that's a wooden fence, all right? And <laughs> as he mentioned, what most people have is they have a fence terminating right into the side of your garage with a wood gate coming right up under the eaves where the, the flames can dwell there and get into your attic and then we're off to the races. So there's nothing wrong with replacing it with a non-flammable fence there or masonry. Do a masonry wall on the steel gate, you know? That could, alone could help save your house. Don't pile wood up against your house, as he showed. So many homes we lost in scripts we lost that way. Shake shingle roofs and wood sheds right up against the house. So from a landscape standpoint, in zone one, we like to use a lot of hardscape. I know Todd loves that mulch right there, right? <laughs> This is huge, guys. Don't plant under your eaves. This is also where I'm very consistent with Todd. This apron helped save this house. This was the Witch Creek Fire. This is one of my customers. 
It was so hot that the lawn actually burned. That streak down there, that was a metal water tank. Okay, this was a very hot fire. Every other house on the street burned to the ground, except for our customers. It's pretty heady stuff to walk into a neighborhood to see that your customer's house is the only one left standing. <laughs> Concrete, gravel, or decomposed granite aprons. Okay. No, I do not recommend using mulch right up to the side of the house. <laughs> Absolutely not. Here's a house that also survived the cedar fire. And you can see this was one of the first houses built. This was in 2000. This is actually before the Cedar Fire, but we thought, let's put a apron all the way around the house. Now we make them a little larger. Uh, we had low hydrated vegetation and DG path. This house went through the fire just fine. In fact, it was part of our fire study for the U.S. Navy, which we'll talk about in a minute. Maybe in that zone one, we're doing things like lawns, but instead of lawns, let's use a native lawn substitute like field sedge. Which, oh, by the way, you can't mow. So, makes great lawn substitute. Okay, zone two, that's that next 50 to 70 feet. It's up to 150 feet in some jurisdictions. Okay. Site hygiene is everything. This home has been through four fires. That's actually the barn, okay? That is an Engelman oak tree, which is rare and endangered, much more so after the 2007 fires. And the reason it has a yellow color is because it's covered in bright yellow flowers. Why is that? Because we removed every non-native weed that was killing the oak trees on this property. Weeds and natives are an ecological switch, guys. All right? Look how clean this is. All right? That's how the oak trees talk. Thank us, all 40 of them. All 40 mature Engelman oak trees went into bright yellow bloom, followed by lots of acorns, followed by lots of baby oak trees. <laughs> this is what it looked like before. Okay, this burns. And this is not native. Okay, the only native in this picture is that oak tree right there. Here's an example of what high site hygiene does for you. Um, this is a mission manzanita which grows in San Diego County. And it is healthy as can be, beautiful, hydrated. You wouldn't know a fire even came through there except for the burned out dead knotwood right here and the ash, but all the weeds were removed. All it burned was a little bit of the duff layer. Okay, that's what site hygiene is about. You remove the ladder fuels by doing that and you enhance the health of the natives on the property and their hydration, which is incredibly, it's all about hydration, guys. It's not about plant lists. I'm gonna dissuade you right there, except junipers. <laughs> junipers suck. <laughs> I'm talking from experience here, man. <laughs> this is a real important concept that Todd touched on. You know, we like to keep about a six foot uh, clearance here. We like to go three times the height for whatever the understory is. So if this is two feet, then I try to do another six feet of clear space. Uh, thinning existing plant communities. And this was proven in our study too. This is also very effective. What I mean is we take it down by about 50%. This is actually a very hopeful talk because if you get nothing else away from this talk, I want you to know that we can create defensible space and fire resistant landscapes without destroying the natural environment around our house, the habitat that we moved here in the first goddamn place, okay? So, 50% looks like this, all right? You basically are going through and carving out a mature native landscape from impenetrable chaparral in this case. We actually grind up everything that, tree, those trimmings are actually the best mulch you could ever possibly imagine. We put it right back down the ground because when you open it up like this, what wants to come back? Weeds, fire, ladder, <laughs> that's what a that's what a properly maintained thin chaparral landscape can look like. It's your own friggin' private park. It's beautiful. That is a completely natural chaparral landscape that has been properly maintained. And yes, it went through the cedar fire without burning down the house. 
We're even messing around with using light overhead irrigation. How many of you guys have seen me speak before? Okay. You know how much I love beer systems, right? <laughs> we try to give our native landscapes, we try to recreate Mother Nature as best we can, including overhead irrigation, but very light. MP rotators are like mana from heaven. So they put down 0.49 inches of cooling precipitation an hour, just like a gentle rainstorm. Well, this is what happens when you lightly irrigate natural coastal city scrub. Do you see the difference? This is in so much better hydrated condition around this house than the uh, non-irrigated natural vegetation behind it. This has consequences for flammability, it really does, okay? And we're not screwing up this ecosystem at all because I'm only watering it two or three times a month for less than a quarter inch each time. Well, you can get an inch of rainfall in a thunderstorm in the summer. This is about three quarters a month. One thing we like to do is we like to create perimeter roads. Uh, this is a 12 foot wide, Basically, dirt road that we created around the 75 to 100 foot perimeter of this house. The, the owner was horrified at first, but later grew, grew to love his country lane. As I mentioned, this is that same house that's been through four fires now and done beautifully well. Um, within that perimeter, we have well-maintained, lightly irrigated native landscaping. Within zone one, which is about 30 feet, we actually put in a stone wall, and within that we have regularly irrigated non-native and some native vegetation. <clears throat> what else did we do? We put an eight-foot decomposed granite apron all the way around this house. I think Todd would appreciate that. All the way around, eight foot wide. Notice also the roof, metal, okay? Uh, look at the native garden, the vegetation, well spaced. Uh, the profile isn't very high, it's lightly irrigated. And yes, that is shredded redwood bark mulch. We'll talk about that in a second. <coughs> yes, I just said all this. Now, three, scratch four. So, yeah, that's what it looks like. Like, the, like I said earlier, the fire falls at Yosemite going sideways at 60 miles an hour. Okay, and so the Navy heard about our success because we've had something like a total of 27 homes go through major fire events. And uh, they actually uh, hired us to do a five-year research study and actually apply some science to this stuff. Everything now is kind of anecdotal, all right, and often highly destructive. So the Navy, why is the Navy interested? They're out in the middle of the ocean, right? Well, guess what? They administer tens of thousands of acres of naval housing right against wildland interfaces. When somebody says, you know, you can landscape around these communities with something that is drought tolerant, that is low maintenance, that has incredible habitat, because believe it or not, the Navy's interested in habitat. They have some pretty rabid biologists working for them. <laughs> that looks good all year long, is great erosion control, and yes, it's all California native. They were interested. So, my co-principal investigator is Dr. John Keeley. Have anybody, anybody heard of John Keeley? He's one of the leading fire ecologists in North America, if not the world. He's written over 400 papers on fire behavior and fire ecology. I was pretty honored when John agreed to become part of the study. So, you know, our goals were to develop science-based fuel management strategies that were ecologically sustainable, that supported natural habitat, a lower water maintenance requirement, aesthetically pleasing, and then we would take that data and we entered into something called the fuel and fire tools software because people are rather loath to have you lighting fires on their property. <laughs> So we use this very sophisticated modeling software. And the selection criteria is the homes had to be located at the wildland urban interface, had survived a major fire event, and they had to include a lightly 
irrigated native landscape. That is a native landscape. It had to be, it had to have natural chaprock coastal sage scrub thinned according to common prescriptions and a control area of just solid native vegetation that had been untreated. And here are the results. Here's a summary of the results. I have a lot more graphs in here and I took them out. Um, this is rate of fire spread, meters per minute, okay? So this is the irrigated, the lightly irrigated native landscapes. This is the thinned chaparral landscapes, and these are the untreated. What this is saying is that the rate of fire spread was lower for the irrigated, followed by the thinned, followed by the controls. Regardless of slope, regardless of wind speed, okay? And these are actually for buckwheat, which people tend to think of as a fire bomb. And these were for all chaparral sites, consistent throughout. You know what benefited the most from supplemental irrigation? You guys aren't as familiar with this because it doesn't grow up here. It's called laurel sumac. Yeah, yeah. You guys know what laurel sumac is? Uh, Melasma lorina, often treated as the fire bomb of fire bombs. And no, you wouldn't want to have one growing next to your house and touching the eaves. But shockingly, benefited from the little bit of hydration we were giving them. And also thinning, thinning was huge. Thinning had a very marked effect on reducing flammability. So here's kind of a summary. The rate of fire spread was lowest for irrigated native plantings, followed by thin, followed by untreated. Apparently the benefits were apparent regardless of slope and wind speed. Okay, well, native plants maintain much, this is really important right here, guys. Native plants maintain a much higher live fuel moisture content than traditional plants on less water. And evergreen natives exhibited the highest live fuel moisture content. So what we're saying here, guys, is if you want to create a fire resistant, native, fire resistant landscape in your defensible space, if you get it just a little bit of supplemental irrigation on the order of maybe a quarter inch, two, three times a month, you can maintain levels of live fuel moisture at or higher than ornamental landscapes on less water. Let that sink in for a second. That you can create defensible space with California native plants that at, are at or even better levels of live fuel moisture on much less water. You realize what I just said? <laughs> We're using native plants to create fire resistant landscapes and here's some friggin' science, finally. <laughs> Okay, it's all anecdotes until now. This is what we did for years. This is what we saw in the field. This is actual measured light fuel moisture content for native plants, all right? Where did I, I, I knew this. I knew this 25 years ago. Why? Because my mentor is a gentleman named Bert Wilson, Las Palitas Nursery. And yeah, I may rest in peace. Bert was my mentor. Bert was a Cal Fire fireman for 14 years. He beat this stuff into me from day one. Okay? So these are using these same protocols that I learned many years ago before we started getting these massive firestorms at the regular intervals we do now. And it was so incredibly wonderful to see that our, you know, what our, our hypotheses and theories were actually correct, supported by science. Um, lower growing natives exhibit even better fire behavior. That means we're using a lot of native ground covers, a la CNO fish, Yankee Point, Backers, Pigeon Point. Uh, even ground cover forms of buckwheat did well. Like Bruce Dickinson, it's only six inches high by 10 feet across. Incredible ground cover. Added benefits. 
Excellent natural habitat, erosion control, low water use, ease of maintenance, and visual appeal. Ta-da. All right, so that was our Navy study. There's lots of areas of continued research possible. We won't get into that for time. But I want to just show a couple of basic conclusions. Uh, hydration really does take precedence over plant lists. Everybody wants me to come up with this plant list of safe native plants versus don't use these. It really doesn't work that way. Okay? And it wasn't borne out by our real experience in fires. Um, here's even just a little unscientific test that we did trying to burn some native chaparral plants after we got about a week before a uh, quarter inch of precipitation. Uh, we couldn't get anything to sustain any plain night in the sage. Out of frustration, I threw everything together. We tried to burn that. I couldn't get that to ignite. <laughs> but this is what happens when you add dead, dormant, dry weeds to the mix. And now it's off to the races. And that is the worst condition. When we go in and these disturb these habitats and it comes back in non-native grasses and mustards, and it's like this in summer, and the health of the natives are compromised and their hydration is down, that is the worst of all possible scenarios. So a thousand acres can go up virtually simultaneously. We have these flashy fuels mixed with dehydrated, unhealthy native plants. Okay. Um, you know, if you look, you know, for what are you gonna put on your slope? Well, nothing at all is a bad option for most slopes. Uh, ice plant, you can look at drought tolerant, non-natives and succulents, which is what most people do because they've killed every native they ever planted, unfortunately. <laughs> so you get that, you get a lot of designers, I'm not saying anybody here, but I'm just saying, you do get some people out there that will bait and switch you. You'll ask for a native landscape design and they'll give you Mexican sage and Mexican marigold and lavender, which I like, but they're nice, but not native. Or natives. They all have advantages and disadvantages. Ice plant. Do you use a lot of ice plant out here? No. Uh, boy, you only knew what you're missing. <laughs> you know, it's cheap and readily available down south and quick fill and it's green. It's crappy erosion control. It needs lots of water to stay healthy, invasive, and boring downright ugly. Oh, it can form thatches that burn too, by the way. It's not very fire resistant. And then you have Mediterranean plants, which are certainly gorgeous. Uh, I use them from time to time. Better availability for those. Very colorful at times, but they do need about twice the amount of water to reach that same level of fire resistance. And I've got pictures to show you what I mean. Uh, better slope stabilizers than ice plant, but not as good as natives. Higher maintenance than natives, because you got to do a lot of deadheading on these kind of plants if you don't want it to look like tumbleweeds when they're done blooming. They have wildlife value, but certainly not like the plants that the wildlife evolved with. I like that whole concept of planted and they will come, you know, Kevin Costner concept. And of course, natives, right? By the way, this was at a major condominium community complex in Carlsbad. Those oaks were actually deeded with the property. This was all covered in Japanese honeysuckle and non-native ice plant, and the trees were dying. We came in there, removed all that crap, put in a native landscape, now they're pushing out three feet of growth a year, okay? It's a big deal. They use less water to achieve fire resistance. Soil biology is naturally soil stabilizing through mycorrhizal fungi, which we really haven't talked too much about today. Uh, evergreen natives are virtually no maintenance. That's a really important concept, guys. Evergreens, they get forgotten in all this discussion on how to design native landscapes. We don't usually use fertilizer or soil amendments. Now that might contradict some of the things you've heard, but we found that most native plants have very little organic matter in the soil. And disturbing the soil, kind of, and adding soil amendments typically shifts it away from being a clean fungal-based ecology to a anaerobic bacterial-based ecology. So what we do is we promote something called mycorrhizal fungi. Have you guys ever heard of mycorrhizae? Yes. Yeah. 
Mycorrhiza doesn't like disturbance, it doesn't like fertility, but it does the job of pulling the nutrients out of the inorganic soil and rock. It also stabilizes the soil because it's an unbelievable amount of biomass that's agglutinating. And oh, by the way, uh, endomycorrhizae is responsible for up to 27% of the world's carbon sequestration in the form of glomalin, which is an organic polymer that forms the tubules of the fungi that stays in the soil, even as it's sloughed off by the root hairs. So that's a really important concept. Uh, great bird and butterfly habitat. Naturally weed resistant, about 70% canopy coverage. That's an important concept for natives. That mycorrhizal communal uh, biology is, when you hit about 70% canopy coverage, it, it has a natural weed resistance that's associated with it. If you've ever been hiking in really healthy chaparral or woodland communities, there's no weeds. That's when you add a lot of fire and a lot of disturbance that the weeds start to show up and start to degrade the plant community and destroy the mycorrhizal network. Uh, disadvantage, not as many suppliers, although I gotta tell you, I love this nursery here. You guys ever been to CNL? We have a native nursery right here in Mill Valley on Shoreline. It is an incredible destination. Get your asses over there. <laughs> Support your local businesses. Come on, man. Yeah, it is a, it's a beautiful destination. Hey, how's this been there? Okay, all right. So you know what I'm talking about. It's gorgeous. Great selection of plants, too. And most natives don't like ornamental horticulture or drip irrigation. Okay, that's what mycorrhizae, that's endomycorrhizae. Uh, it's incredibly microscopic and it's called endo because it creates these little, uh, are, what are called arbuscles inside the um, root cells and there's an exchange of moisture nutrition that occurs there. You know, the plants are getting a lot of their nutrition, their minerals and moisture from the mycorrhizal fungi. What's the fungi get out of the deal? Sugar. Huh? Sugar. Sugar. Yeah. You guys are all right. 20% of the carbohydrate production. I'm impressed. Okay, that's endo. Here's ecto, which is much larger and external. Forms sheaths around the root hairs. And we all know their fruiting bodies, which are mushrooms. Like truffles, chanterelles, morels. Okay, those are all ectomycorrhizal fruiting bodies. I'm impressed. When it comes to native design, this is what gets forgotten a lot. Um, you really need to create a strong background to a native landscape, okay? We use about 75% evergreen plants that have foliar color and contrast, like John Dorley Manzanita, like the Santa Cruz Island buckwheat, like the Yankee Point, uh, like the Bacris, the Ceanothus. That's what's going to keep that landscape looking good all year long. You actually don't have to accept that a native landscape is going to look like tumbleweeds in fall. If it's all perennials and annuals, yeah, yeah, you have to deal with that, and that might be a little difficult for public perception. We love them, we don't care, but you know, if you're going to try to mainstream this stuff, you need strategies that are going to make it acceptable to a large part of the populace, and this is what does it. And actually, this holds true to most of our natural communities anyway. If you're to go out in your woods now, it doesn't look like tumbleweeds or it won't in summertime, right? That's all the evergreen, the manzanitas, and, uh, the ceanothus, and the supporting foundational plants. And so we create this backbone and we pay attention to that foliar color. Manzanitas are incredible for giving you foliar color. Sunset manzanita, John Dorley. And And the evergreens are important for fire resistance, by the way, too. They seem to be a little better at hanging on to the moisture, even in the face of flames. And they seem to maintain a higher level of hydration on the same uh, levels of supplemental irrigation. And then the perennials, your color spots, okay? Your penstemons, in this case, Bachiopsis, you probably don't know what that is. Uh, it's a type of San Diego Marguerite. We got Penstemon, Centrapicolius, and Eridrons. There's Eridrons. Yes, I'm using Eridrons in San Diego. 
Um, those are color spots. Don't go right along the edges, okay? So we don't tend to make a whole landscape out of perennials. For one thing, you have the tumbleweed issue. For another, it's a tremendous amount of maintenance. You get in there and have to, have to uh, you know, do your deadheading. And it also is not as weed resistant as a evergreen type, back solid type landscape. So, but boy, you mix them up and you, you mix them up that have different bloom cycles and you put some epilobiums out there for summer, fall. It looks great all year long. You've got something blooming all year long. Here's how we irrigate typically. Uh, and all but the narrowest maybe planters, we usually use overhead. I love empty rotators. 12 inch pop ups on swing joints. This is standard, uh, uh, standard operating procedure for us. Drip has been a problem, drip. We developed these protocols, guys, because when I started in 1995, 40 to 60% mortality was accepted as normal in a native landscape down there. Okay, now it's running about five. So, 40 to 60% mortality is not a viable business model for someone who wants to be a landscape contractor, okay? So, we just try to control the boundary conditions so it's more closer to an ecological uh, system and not try to introduce anything that we know is foreign to that system because we don't know how it's going to go rippling through that very poorly understood system of variables that are all inter interdependent. And if you have drip, it's really easy to switch over to microsprays. It solves the problem right there. Yeah, and it also is good for foliar hydration for fire. When we plant, we space out for final size and use one to five gallon plants typically. Uh, that's usually what's available from nurseries. And here's our mulch. All right. Um, we love shredded redwood bark. We love gorilla hair. Been using it since 1996. Uh, no, we're not cutting down redwood forest to make gorilla hair. It's actually a byproduct of the milling process that used to be burned. And at least we're giving it a good purpose. Yes, I'd love to get it to the point where maybe we don't have to use redwood in our construction industry. But right now, at least this product is available, and if it isn't given a good use, an incredibly important ecological use, then it will be burned. And it is the closest thing to emulate the natural duff layer that forms around these plant communities. That's what we're trying to do. Why? Because it breaks down very slowly. I actually don't like dump mulches because A, they're full of all kinds of trash and chemicals and crud and weeds, but also they break down so quickly. We don't want to load up these ecosystems with tons of nutrition. <laughs> you give these plants all the nutrition they want, what happens, they drop that mycorrhizae like it's a hot potato because it's stealing 20% of their carbohydrates. It becomes a parasite. And you lose all that protection and these plants flame out overnight. Nothing dies faster than a native plant. It's like that. Okay, so shredded redwood has been incredible as a simulant for the natural duff layer because you're going into that chicken and egg scenario. And it also is an amazing erosion control. It can stick to very steep slopes, one and a half to one slopes. But when you use it, and this is so damn important, you gotta consolidate it. You gotta water it down and mat it down. You leave it all fluffy, it will burn like hell, okay? Well, so does steel wool. Have you ever, did you guys ever burn steel wool when you were kids? It burns like hell. Oh my God, but it's oxygenated, incredibly well oxygenated. This stuff is very fibrous and it maps down like carpeting. That is the, all the difference in the world between something really flammable and something that has a two inch flame height. And by the way, this is how healthy it is. 14 months later, that's what that planting looked like. Okay, it doesn't take long. Oh, you wanna know how it burned? Well, here you go. So what was the mistake I made here, guys? No, no, no. It's right up to the house. Huge mistake. Last time we ever did that. So very consistent with what Todd was saying. We like these aprons, inorganic aprons around the house. Okay. What is significant about this picture, though? 
Even though I made that mistake, it actually was serendipitous. Why? Because look at the scorch marks. Okay, two inches, all right? These plastic flags went in before the fire. That's right. We just put in a new planting and marked them all for watering. The only one that melted was actually this one because the garden hose caught on fire. Okay? So we have lots of pictures like this. How do we plant? Well, this is a bit involved. Stay with me on this. You dig a hole and you stick them in. <laughs> right? I don't usually amend or fertilize. I like to make the hole a little shallow so they stick up above the surrounding soil for drainage. Twice as wide, backfill the soil, do the plant pants, and you create a temporary basin, especially on slopes, to hold that water. Oh, I hit the wrong one again. There we go. Come on. If I have six to 12 inch rocks, I'll put them right on the root ball, and then we'll try to float them back out of the hole. That first watering is the most important that plant will ever see. Okay. We do that because we want to settle the soil and get rid of the air pockets. So we might hit it with one to five gallons in clay soil, up to 30 gallons in really sandy soil. That day. How am I doing? You're a little over. I'm already all a little over. Huh? Okay, I'm gonna zip through, guys. Uh, one quick mention, any guys have Argentine ants? Yes. <laughs> The little ants that get in your kitchen and that? Yes. Oh, yes. In Southern California, they're responsible for 75% of the mortality in California native plants. Those bumps are actually scale. They nest in the roots, guys. They nest in the roots, and they kill the native plants by putting scale and aphids all over the roots, sucking all the moisture and sugar out of the plant, and you don't even know what's happening. And if half the plant dies, that's usually the half that the nest is on. They also transmit diseases through this process, directly inoculating the roots. And they also plant weeds like crazy. Like crazy. Not just spurge, uh, all kinds of weeds. And every one of those weeds that they plant is a new place to set up a colony. We have strategies to deal with them. So the last part here is case histories of actual photos of landscapes that went through fire. I know that I'm pushing it here. It's about five minutes. What do you guys yeah. think? Yeah. 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 I, I need to talk to the boss. Here's what I'm going to say. Let's listen to Greg, and we'll cut our break really short and go right into yes. yeah. okay. Are you guys okay with that? Yeah. You're very kind. Thank you. I love you guys. I feel I'm so honored. I'm serious. You guys treat me like royalty. Thank you. Okay, most fire involved native landscapes, any contractor in California, a few examples, one in the Pumasha, two in the Pines up in Julian, seven in the Cedar Fire, six in the Witch Creek Fire, two in the Harris Fire, not Harrison, one in Hidden Meadows and a bunch of other little ones around. Fire Marshal for the City of Encinitas actually ran actual burn tests on the gorilla here. Asked me what kind of fire retardant I was putting in the stuff. <laughs> there you go. All right. So I want you to know this is Cedar Fire 2003. Uh, notice the flags. Notice that not all of the mulch burned. This was a major conflagration. Okay, there's the back of the house. It didn't mean it almost didn't burn. There was a cord of firewood stack back here. <laughs> the wife and husband got into an enormous fight. Thank God she won. So the husband removed that firewood a week before the Cedar Fire. Put out over by the propane tank. <laughs> also, a lot of hardscape. Look at all the flags. See the flags everywhere? Flags in the burned mulch, still not melted. Um, it also almost burned because they had wicker fire at their back door. And the flame height was like, I don't know, seven, eight feet at least. They busted down the door, broke out the the uh, interior uh, drywall and stuff and save the house. The house also had double pane windows, boxed in eaves, uh, tile roof was plugged, and all the things that they needed to do to harden off this house, and that's why it survived. And that was the lookout the back door. 
Bush Creek Fire 2007, you wouldn't know a fire went through there except for this incinerated Benjamin, Ficus Benjamina back there. <laughs> Notice though the wild grape. Green is the day it was planted. Excellent, excellent plant. Uh, in fire areas for a vine and also notice what the trellis is built out. We built it out of masonry and steel, not wood. Okay, Okay, this is something that kind of surprises people. That black smudge there was ground cover rosemary. This was a native buckwheat that had blown in on the site. This slope was getting watered every two weeks in summertime and the buckwheat still had green leaves all over it. Next to the black smudge was the rosemary. If we were watering this once a week, then the rosemary probably would have been twice. Again, too much stuff close to the house, but because it was hydrated, we didn't we didn't even have any burn scars on the house. And of course, that back thing with the apron, that's really important. Uh, okay, so this did not burn hot enough to burn that wooden deck at the back of the house, uh, which we didn't install, by the way. I don't think I would have. Um, but again, notice there's your irrigation, right? So getting irrigated about every 10 to 14 days in summertime. And uh, everything's still alive there. I mean, here's the same landscape uh, three years later. Okay, nothing died. Yeah, this is a really important concept, okay? People were clearing for hundreds of feet around their homes, okay? There was nothing. The environmental devastation all around, man. The homes were just piles of rubble, okay? Well, this is the old aerospace engineer in me, and I recognized laminar flow when I saw it. What's laminar flow? Well, basically, you just created the perfect bowling alley for embers. You literally have removed every object in those embers' path that could have perturbed that airflow and created turbulence and also acted as hydrated ember catchers. If you saw the picture in Dan's thing this morning, that was actually from uh, Carlsbad near me in the 2014 fires, covered in ice plant and some bushes and some palm trees and rubble, okay? There was very little in there to actually stop those embers from contacting the house. It's a really, really simple concept. But I saw a video during the lilac fire down there where you saw this fire tornado cross the highway and hit the vegetation in a, um, a mall right there. And the vegetation wasn't native, but it was probably being watered three to five times a week. And caught all the embers and then went out. And we actually think that's what's happening in the native landscapes, only it takes so much less water to hydrate a native landscape than a non-native one. Not a really difficult concept, but really hasn't been looked at, you know? So this guy literally took out incredible swaths of beautiful chaparral and no house, except that there's some palm trees. Okay, same here, done. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Yeah, same here. I mean, the grass is still green. Oh, here in the Harris Fire, what happened? Well, the fire actually hit the edge of the hydrated landscape, <coughs> went around both sides, continued on, went right on up Lions Peak. Okay? It didn't even burn the mulch in here. The embers didn't even catch the mulch on fire. It was pretty amazing. I mean, it doesn't get any starker than this, right? $150,000 whole solar array, about 10 feet of native irrigated plantings, wild chaparral, okay. And he was pretty happy to see his solar rate and his house still standing. <coughs> Erosion control is a big issue after fires. Some of you might have a goalie behind your house, all right? Do not go in there and seed it. Don't do like the convicted felon did. We have a uh, Duncan Hunter. Um, brought in 20,000 pounds of ryegrass seed and seeded all around East County. Well, it takes three or four good rains to germinate that crap. It's the worst allelopathic non-native you could possibly plant. It destroys the native ecology. And what you really should be doing is putting in T-posts, leaving the branches in the T-posts, and 
and letting water come through and holding back debris. You're doing this about every 20, 30 feet. Create debris dams, works great. And the wildflowers will come back on their own. You leave it alone. Yeah, this is one that's aerial seeded up on Quest of Great near San Luis Obispo. Here it is, if you leave it alone. This was actually in Escondido. After the fire, everybody's running to the desert to see the wildflowers, and we had even better displays right there in the city. And the landscapes also came back. That's just a site that was seeded, okay? With non-native grasses, a star thistle. This is what it should have looked like. There's even glass on the ground from this melted silica. A year later, five years later, the end. There you go. Thanks, guys.